Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with the town of Elmer, Ontario, Councillor Catherine Desrosiers. Nestled in Elgin County, southern Ontario, Elmer is a charming town just located north of Lake Erie. Elmer's picturesque setting attracts visitors seeking historical charm and natural beauty. Elmer's roots trace back to 1817 when John Van Patter, the first settler, established the town. Originally named Troy, it was renamed Elmer in 1835 to honor Lord Elmer, the Governor-in-Chief of British North America. Now, with a population of approximately 8,000 residents, Elmer enjoys its rich heritage, agricultural fairs, and vibrant community life. This is Cross-Border Interviews with Councillor Catherine Desrosiers. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciated. I want to start to get to know who, the persona behind the councillor's position. So I've got to ask, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Catherine? I think ultimately it was it came down to the right time, the right place, the right time, as it probably is with the majority of representatives. Um, I was first approached by a councillor from the previous term, uh, Tom Charlton, uh, after I appeared as a delegate for a couple development items. He was impressed, he said, with my knowledge and my confidence to address the table. Um, and he questioned my interest in municipal politics. Uh, you know, he was instrumental. He encouraged me to run. He helped me research kind of the position um, and ultimately was the catalyst that started my nomination for council. I don't think if it wasn't for him, I don't think I would be here at least this term um, because he really ignited that spark. Um, there was also, uh, I had my son in 2019 and being a mother um, and becoming more involved in the community, I became more cognizant of issues within the community and I wanted to be involved where those issues were being addressed. Um, knowing what I know now, I feel the majority of those issues were not being discussed for the simple fact that the demographic of representation was imbalanced. Um, also, what you, I mean, what do you mean by I, that? Sorry, what do you mean by that? I just want to make sure I, I understand what you mean by the, the demographics. Are you just saying, and I'm not, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth here. I just want to make no, sure. No, it's I'm totally fine. Are you saying women weren't represented on council or are you saying younger generation wasn't uh, represented on council? What demographic are you specifically talking about here? So specifically for these issues, I would say age um, okay. and background. Uh, our last term was actually, we had a majority of female representation. We had four female uh, representatives and both the mayor and the deputy mayor were female. And then we had the three male representatives. So there was quite a, an even balance the last term. This town, there's no, there, this term, there's not the same balance. There's only two female elected female representatives, and then there's five elected male representatives, which is fine. But I think the majority of the issues, like if you look historically at our councils, I think I can say confidently, I'm the youngest representative that the town has ever had. Um, and it's not historically, it's been the majority of the demographic was like 60 plus. So nothing against that demographic. I think they offer valuable insights and uh, perspective, but when you have a table that's all the same representation, it's essentially an unfair bias, in my opinion, because there's no, there's no diversity, there's no different backgrounds, there's not really a a good engaged discussion that you know from different two different situations, two different life circumstances, it's all kind of one 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 viewpoint. So I mean, like I said, nothing against the older demographic. I think they're great. It's just for any type of um, political situation, I think there's nothing wrong with diversity. I think it's great. So before Tom came and asked you to run, your former the former councillor who asked you to run, and prior to you uh, having your son in 2019 or your your child in 2019, I, I apologize. I don't know if it was if he had a son or daughter. I do apologize. There, son, it's okay. <laughs> son, um, yeah. Had you considered politics as something you would ever get into? Because 
traditionally when I speak to municipal counselors, it's it was never on the radar until someone actually asked me and then the wheels start turning. Was that something like you? That's a great follow-up question. Um, it was. It was definitely a interest of mine. However, <laughs> I embarrassingly was under the false narrative that the position had unofficial requirements, um, specifically age, occupation, educational background. Um, and unfortunately, I think this false narrative is a major factor for the lack of younger representation. Personally, I would like my term to serve as an example for future young leaders who are who are interested in running for office. You know, seeing me do it, well, if she can do it, you know, why can't I? So um, I hope, I, I think there is people out there that it is on their radar, they are interested, but they have the same insecurities that I unfortunately had as well, right? So yeah. So, so prior to those, that sort of misunderstanding of what the official unofficial requirements might be yeah. because they're truly as long as you're a citizen you're over the 18 you yes. can run probably yeah. um looking back on the first year and a half year and a bit almost 15 months since you were sworn into office in november of 2022 what advice would you give a prospective younger person someone who is thinking I might want to get into this line of field. I might want to become a counselor one day or even mayor or deputy mayor. What advice would you give them to sort of make them aware of what the roles and responsibilities of a counselor would be? I think, like I said, back to the demographic thing, like any educational background, uh, any age, any occupation, like there's not a specific characteristic. My experience with business and property and management was very beneficial uh, for me specifically. So if someone had a little bit of a business background, I think that would be really good. Um, you need a lot of confidence. Like you need confidence. You you can't, um, if you have self-doubt or insecurities, like it's, it's, it's going to hinder you. So I think having confidence or even just faking it till you make it, like it, whatever you need to do to um, establish that, like confidence is essential. And also following your, intuition like that I feel like it doesn't matter what your educational or your background is everybody has that little voice inside of them that when something doesn't feel right it's probably not right and you should look at it you should question it um, and not be afraid to question it either so I think like I said confidence um, and following your intuition and a little bit of a business background like would, would really help but at the end of the day even if you don't have those specific characteristics like you could still do it like and if you need help like I'm sure there's people out there I'd be one of them that'd be willing to offer a type of guidance or encouragement to assist because at the end of the day the having a more diverse representation is 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 essential for uh, a fair democrat a fair governance in my opinion. <laughs> You, you've opened up a few can of worms that I want to play in for a few seconds, if you don't mind. Okay. And I, I want to start by asking about sort of the tough decisions, the gut intuition you've talked about. Yeah. Now, you've been in council for 15 months. Uh, as of recording this, you're going on, to, uh, as of this airing, you'll be going on to your 16th month. Mm -hmm. How do you make those tough choices? Because the decisions you make at the end of the day are going to impact your residents. They're going to be the ones who uh, are going, your neighbors, your family members. And that is probably the toughest part of one of the, one of the toughest parts of the job is making the decisions for the betterment of the community for you. Was that hard to sort of grapple with to, that your decisions that you vote on in council are going to impact the lives of your, the people who you know? Yes, like there's there's obviously going to be a, a sense of pressure, um, but at the end of the day, there's there's no way of um, appeasing everybody, right? It's it's physical to me. It's impossible. Like say you, it's not so, counselor. Come on, Catherine. Yeah, <laughs> no. Like, like there's always going to be. Yeah, there's always going to be somebody, right? So I think you know, using your, your moral compass, um, like looking at things and, and what's right, what's wrong. I mean, that's like the first obvious, uh, tool in the toolkit. Um, also like when I make a decision, like just because I make a decision, like nothing is set in stone, right? I make the best decision I can make based off the information that is presented at that time. But that information and in, in anything in life, like any information in life is constantly evolving. So as the information evolves, um, 
in correlation, the decision is always evolving, right? So you make so, the so have best you, have, decision. Have, have you gone into a council meeting thinking you're going to vote one way and then heard a delegation or yes. heard a fellow counselor say, well, this is how it actually is. And yes. you go, oh, now I have to think of it some other way. Yes, yes, I have. And like it, and it, the, the idea or the opinion that I had beforehand was not malicious in nature. It was just based off the information I had. A delegate came forward, presented other information that was not initially presented, um, opinions from other council members about how they felt about it. Yes, absolutely. Right. So you make the best decision you can make at the time with the information given. And like I said, utilize that moral compass. Like, don't be afraid to listen to that intuition. And if that little voice is telling you that something is wrong, then take that time to question it and to look into it further because it's it's typically not wrong. <laughs> so you were there to represent the entire community. I, I, I understand in 2022, you were claimed into this position. So no one else, every single mm -hmm. counselor position was acclaimed. So I can't ask the question, how do you represent the people who didn't vote for you? Because technically no one voted for you because you were acclaimed. But you have to represent everyone. And we talk about unconscious bias a lot on the show and traditionally we do have those we have those social echo chambers that we like to go talk to our friends about certain issues how important is it for you as a counselor to listen to both sides the people who agree on an issue and the people who disagree on an issue because both have the validity to have those opinions but you as counselor have to make the best decision and you have to listen to both sides to make sure you are getting it right for the community do you not Oh, absolutely. So I feel like, you know, I humbly acknowledge that I, nor even staff, like town staff are always going to have the full picture. Um, I appreciate other perspectives. I think they're valuable, even if they're against the common narrative. Um, that's what the democratic governance is built on, in my opinion. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's the ability to challenge elected officials um, on their decisions and engage with them about, um, you know, issues that are arising. So I think that's, it's essential. Like, I think that perspective and that those opinions from the public, like I said, even if they're against the common narrative, like they are essential for a, a democratic process. Do you find people willing to give their opinion? Few, there's few, but in my opinion, I feel like not enough. Um, I feel I, the, the impression I get from my demographic, so my friends, my family, residents here that I'm close with, is that they feel that their opinions fall on deaf ears, which is very sad. Um, I always tell them that they can, you know, talk to me about it anytime they want or, you know, uh, come as a delegate to council because I will not be a deaf ear. But I think they feel that they bring these concerns and, you know, their concerns will either be questioned or judged or, there'll be no result from them. So why bother, right? So um, I hope I don't project that that feeling on any resident because like I said, at, at the end of the day, um, it doesn't matter what their opinion is, like uh, they have a, a right to be heard and listened to. So um, necessarily those those opinions don't have to be acted on. Like that's the decision of council to debate and, 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 and engage with, but those residents have the right to be heard um, and have their opinions listened to. So I, I genuinely hope they do. So when, when people do, I, I understand that, that there's an apathy around a certain generation. And I say that respectfully because I think there's some people who are not, but some people who are, when people do approach you and talk about issues that they're facing, are you seeing a blurring of jurisdictional lines? You as a municipal counselor know what the roles and responsibility of the municipality need to be. You're responsible for X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But you are the closest to the people. You're not at Queens Park doing your job. You're not in Ottawa doing your job. You are in your community. So when someone approaches you, if they do, or sends you an email, are they talking about municipal issues? Or are they talking about all issues. I have an issue with healthcare. I have an issue with my kid in school right now. Are you seeing a misunderstanding of jurisdictional responsibilities for each level of government? And how do you as a counselor, sort of a follow-up to that, deal with those questions that are not in your jurisdictional purview as a municipal counselor? So yes, to answer your question, um, I, I have both. Like I have residents that come to me about legitimate municipal issues that is our jurisdiction and I have residents come to me about um, issues 
you know, your article that you wrote on January 5th really summed it up. Like, uh, I, that's why I reposted it because there really is that blurring of jurisdictional roles, um, specifically cost of living, uh, health, mental health, uh, affordable housing that truly is the responsibility of the provincial and federal government. But we're seeing that that burden should, like shouldered by the municipalities. So um, ultimately the municipalities don't have the resources to uh, solve those problems at large, right? But um, at the end of the day, I still think it's again, worth listening to the resident. Um, whether, in, whether or not they understand that, I think as a local official, uh, I'm more accessible than those at a higher level. Um, there's also a sense of trust and integrity that I hold as a member of the community specifically. Um, and, you know, even though my representation has limits, at the end of the day, there's still things I can do for that resident. I can listen to them. I can gather information on, on their behalf uh, and then provide them referral for further action, right? So there is certain things I can do. And at the end of the day, if I can be of assistance, I'm happy to help. Like that's that's my job, right? So um my my experience though thus far has been like I would say a good 50-50. And the residents that have come to me have been satisfied with that uh, outcome. So I appreciate that honest answer and thank you for that plug for the the article I wrote. Um I, I want to turn to the town as a whole now because mm -hmm. I'm cautious of time and I want to make sure we get into this because I think this is going to be where sort of the real conversation begins now. I'm not saying that the first part wasn't, it's just I feel like this is where I, I learned a little bit more about communities. But before I start this line of questioning, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even opinion of council. This is the councillor's opinion and only their opinion. She has one vote on council. That is it. So with that being said, counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Elmer today? Well, I think as discussed uh, just previous, the previous question, you know, cost of living, affordable housing, health, mental health are big issues that municipalities are facing across the country. So I don't want to disregard those. They are they are valid issues that we're, you know, unfortunately having to handle and deal with. Um, specific to our area, oh, um, I would say quality of services um, and intergenerational communications. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> Let, let's go with let's go with the second one first because I want to I want to dive into it. If, if what do you mean by intergenerational communication? Because I'm a communications person by trade, journalist. I worked for a municipality as a communications coordinator. Uh, what do you see as being the intergenerational communication issues that you guys face? So I think it goes back to the demographic of representation and what's being heavily dominated right now. Um, it's an interesting time we're seeing. We're having this amalgamation of two very different generations. We have, you know, baby boomers that were born in prosperous times um, and conditioned upon historic practice. And then we have the millennials that were born in a time where the economy was beginning to decline um, and conditioned upon the evolution of technology. So this merging of generations is causing conflicting challenges and like a, a disconnect essentially with our communication. Um, and as I mentioned before, ultimately I find there's a bias of in terms of discussion and having that diverse representation is essential for engaging discussions and progressive and, and having progressive policy. So I hope that explains it. Well, it, it it does. And I appreciate your candor on it. But um, as someone who's worked in the communications for a municipality, I know you can communicate in every different facet. You can communicate by newspaper, by print, by social media. You can communicate by going, knocking on doors and handing out flyers. And I want to stick to the communications part for a little bit. How do you see your role in 
your job as a counselor in bridging that gap in bridging that divide for uh, the intergenerational communication challenges that your community faces, because you're a voice on council, you have that voice, you have that ability to go approach people and bridge that gap. What are you doing specifically to ensure that everyone feels like they're being heard and everyone feels like they're being listened to? That's a good question. I feel optimistically, I hope that, uh, <laughs> you know, moving forward that we do have a more engaged uh, candidacy for future elections. So we have more, like we don't just have an acclaimed council, we have a diverse, you know, lineup of candidates that offer the public, you know, like a choice, right? So um, making the, the table more diverse and allowing a more cohesive conversation to transpire opposed to kind of that like biased almost tunnel vision of a one generational perspective. Um, so hopefully, like I said, optimistically, just uh, inspiring, like I guess ultimately uh, our, like a younger generation and a younger demographic uh, and a different demographic besides the status quo to you know, get engaged with their um, municipal politics and run for office. So I, I hope that answers your question. Is there something it, else you want to? It does. And I just want to just sort of ask the sort of half a million dollar follow-up question to that is, how do you think you're doing? How do you think you're doing on that journey? Because you're 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 in a, you're a year and a bit in, and I can imagine you can't sort of judge the first year by this, what's going to happen three years from now. But are you seeing more people in your community sort of take interest in the younger generation, the more diverse uh, uh, demographics in Elmer? Are you seeing that or are you sort of seeing it semi bubbling right now? Yeah, it was, it's interesting. We just actually had a, a, a study done. It was just published at our last meeting, actually, on the 10th um, regarding the demographic of the town changing. So the study was essentially a... Um, Oh my goodness, what's it called? Where the a census? It was essentially yeah. another census, but it was getting into more like what are what is the gender, what is the uh, age demographic? Like there was more kind of um, in tune studies done about it, and this demographic is is on the rise, and we're actually starting to see the baby boomers starting to uh, you know decrease in size, and we're having this millennial. So I think it was age 20 to 40 or 45, like they're starting to expand. And we also have a growth of zero to 19. So children as well. So we're having this younger demographic and population start to grow and a decrease in our um, older generation, which I mean, I, I the, what I have engaged from the public is that the issues that are coming to light weren't necessarily you know, addressed before, or there wasn't a light shine on, shone on these issues, because again, the representation wasn't reflective of that. So now that there is somebody, and there's actually two, I shouldn't say it's just me, there is one other council member, it's a younger gentleman, he's a little bit older than me, but he's still in that demographic. Our experiences and our questions that we're asking, and you know, the, the reports and the and the written correspondence and press that has followed from those questions and from those discussions is starting to shine a light on okay hold on a second here there's clearly a lack of representation and not a diverse representation so i, I would okay. say yes but i mean that's an individual's opinion so no and that's why it's your opinion part of the show <laughs> so yeah I, um I want to talk about quality of services because it, this is the first time someone's ever brought that up to me during this part of the segment, this part of the show. So I want to get what you mean by that. What do you mean by quality of services? So Elmer has a really good infrastructure base as far as like recreational parks, like there's a good base foundation, um, but they're really prioritizing growth. Um, which growth is great. Everybody needs growth. It's essential, but we're kind of neglecting these services as we're also increasing the growth. So, um, you know, as again, the younger demographic, I'm like, you know, families aren't going to want to move to this, to this town. Like you're, you're hoping to engage in, and grow this town. Who's moving here. It's these, this younger generation. What do they want? This is what they want. Do we have it? No, like we need to, um, increase and perfect our current service levels that we have now to work like hand in hand with that growth. So, um, I mean, at the end of the day, I have a project management background. Uh, therefore, 
it's frustrating for me to see projects that are left half completed or not to full potential. And the potential is there. It's just getting there. So, um, so, it, so, it's, so can I, can I challenge you a little bit on that for a second? Because absolutely. You up, because you brought up two different, two good points. Growth is needed. Growth is great. But with growth comes service levels. If you bring the service mm-hmm. levels in and the growth isn't there, then you're going to potentially, uh, make people pay for it and that means deficit, that taxes yeah. yeah that means taxes are going to have to be raised to offset those service levels increases so how do you balance that as a counselor to make sure that the people aren't being uh sort of burdened with service levels increasing while the growth isn't there or do you just have to do it and hope that growth will come so i mean without speaking uh i guess it would sound optimistic but from what I know being on council, we have an extensive projection of growth happening in this community, um, just based off, you know, planning assessments and applications for development. Like I I know the growth is coming. So whether those service levels are good or not, it's coming. So um, that's definitive as far as how can we, you know, make it affordable for our residents. Uh, Personally, because I'm, I, I sit on specifically a committee that deals with this, the Parks and Beautification Committee, and what I've been doing is gathering the data that we we have currently from our current service levels and really diving into what exactly we're getting for the cost. And right now, it, it's no, it's not a um, a result of malicious or you know unethical practice. It's just somebody doesn't have a a good vision. Um, So I'm trying to implement that. So a good example is, you know, looking at our planting list for parks. Why are we planting? Like I get annuals are beautiful, but why are we planting annuals year after year and just annuals? Like it costs money. It's year after year. It costs money. It's, it's, you know, an expense. Then you have the service time for the park attendants, the watering, like there's this whole expense that when you break it up over the course of the year and you're doing it year after year it's like wouldn't it be a better idea to implement some perennials that are like you know limited maintenance uh you know a one-time cost like they're they perpetuate they reseed themselves like just simple solutions like that that we are starting to look at now because those questions are being asked where before they weren't being asked because the majority of counselors were an older demographic they didn't go to the park, so they didn't see these these concerns because, you know, I'm there every single day with my son, especially in the warmer months, uh, at the splash pad, at the park, biking through the trails. So I'm seeing these issues firsthand and these concerns. So um, there's there's a way. There for sure is a way. It's it's assessing the current uh, service level, the expenses, and 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 really diving into how we can make this better. Like how what what decisions can we make that is going to increase the service level but decrease costs? And there is solutions. I don't have a green thumb, and I know you should never plant annuals as a municipality. You should <laughs> plant, plant, plant perennials, but that's just some me, are fine. <laughs> it's like some are fine, but everything it's like no. <laughs> Agreed. Um, now you've talked about two very big macro issues that you believe they're facing your community. But if I went to Elmer tomorrow and I asked a hundred people hypothetically say, Hey, how do you, uh, what is the biggest issue to you? They would probably give me a hundred different issues, potholes, parks, uh, yeah. service levels, uh, snow removal, particularly now that we're in the middle <laughs> of winter. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual? Because the individual pays the taxes. They want their taxpayer a dollar spent wisely. And their issues, they believe, is their most pressing issue to them. So how do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual, knowing that you have a limited supply of money and you cannot run a deficit? I think just to put it simply is is genuinely listening to the concerns. As I said before, you know, every individual, their concerns are worth representation and and they're allowed to be heard. Like they have a right to bring those concerns to their elected officials and voice them so we can make decisions and we can have that information to make the best decision uh, possible. So I, I mean, listening, like. Is it hard? I'm, is it hard to sort of pick and choose the winners and losers, though? 
I honestly, sadly, I feel like we don't have enough engagement to have that concern. Oh, okay. I wish we did. I genuinely <laughs> wish we did. It'd be great to have a more engaged, um, like community. Like we had a budget survey go out. Um, we do it. I think they do it annually. This previous year was like my first year with it. Um, and I was actually like engaging through my social medias, trying to get like, Hey, like fill this out because it was open to not just residents of Elmer because we have neighboring municipalities that they're very rural and they come to Elmer for services. So it wasn't uh, specific to Elmer residents. It was open to everybody. So I was really engaging with my community on my social platforms and saying, Hey, like, if you have opinions, like, you know, I mean, I'm eager to listen, but like, here you have a chance to voice those concerns, like rate the people and and have your concerns publicly addressed. So we had the highest engagement we've ever had. So we're a town of just under 8,000 people and previous budget surveys were like 150, 160, which is sad in my opinion. It's not very, not much engagement. I think this year was 300 and something, like we over doubled it. So um, I- I'm, It's amazing. I, yeah, compared to, it, like I said, it, it's increased, you know, like by like half the amount. So it's amazing. I, I appreciate you. That, I appreciate that. And I, I, I've been accused on this show, and I'm trying to get out of that accusation period now, is that I only talk about the issues that are facing communities on this show. So I've sort of turned the question that I originally posed to you and I, I flipped it on its head. What does Elmer get right? What is the thing that you guys are proud of that you say, you know what, other communities are doing it good, we're doing it better. What is the thing you boast about to other communities or even to people who might be coming and thinking about moving to Elmer? I would say uh, safety. Like, you know, we have a really, really good emergency service team, uh, fire and police. Um, and, you know, our crime rate and our statistical data for uh, emergency events are low. So we have a very, very safe community. Um, as far as town staff goes, they're really good at their attention to development and forecasting future infrastructure, like looking at, okay, you know, this is the growth. This is what we're going to need when we get to that growth. Therefore, we should be saving in our reserves X amount of dollars to be able to afford that. Like they're really, really good at forecasting that that work and planning for it. So um, I would give credit to our, you know, our planning team, to our uh, management and to our treasurer. Ultimately, she's a rock star. So uh, I would say that is really good. And then finally, our um, community volunteers, as well as the correlated service groups, we have we have a really good participation and community volunteer and service groups um, compared to other rural communities of our size. And I think that's something to be very, very proud of. I want to turn to my last segment here because I'm cautious of time and we're almost at the 40 minute mark. And I want to talk about my favorite subject. And I've promised if you come on my show, I will come to your community. So I will be in Elmer in 2024. Yay! I've actually got a big swing through Southwestern Ontario uh, this summer, right before I head over to the AMO conference. So I've got to ask the question as a tourist or tourists who are link thinking about coming to your community, what should they see? What are the hot spots in your community that you boast about and you tell people, if you come to Elmer, you have to come see this? <laughs> well, the number one thing, in my opinion, unfortunately, it only happens at one specific time, but it is it is renowned, um, is we have a three-port tour. It's, it's a cycling tour that originated here uh, by a group of individuals that are obviously very passionate about cycling. Um, it attracts cyclists from across the province, and it's huge for tourism. It's a scenic tour that starts in Elmer, and then it goes along the coast of Lake Erie to the three major uh, ports. So that specific initiative is amazing. It happens in August. So I don't know if you'll be here in August or not, but, or if you're a cyclist, but that is huge. Like it's a very huge tourism event that happens specifically here. Um, we have several farmers markets. We're very proud of our agricultural background. Um, we have one that's been around since the 1950s. So it's historic to the town. We have one that is just on the outside of town, um, but we basically, we claim it as ours um, and it's multi-generational. So it, it has been around since the 1950s, but it's, it's a family that's been around for a very long time and are established here. 
And then recently we have one that just opened in 2022. It's the old uh, Imperial tobacco plant that has since been converted into a farmer's market. And all three of them are fantastic for local artesian goods um, and community relations. They're really our community hubs. Um, downtown, we have, you know, a lineup of boutiques, uh, an authentic local culture. We have a predominant Mennonite culture here in Elmer, and we have a lot of Mexican heritage as well. So we have a very authentic cultural downtown. Um, we have a town museum that's actually working to relocate to a downtown building in Elmer. Um, and we also have a, which I think is fun, a retro uh, ice cream parlor. It's called Walker Dairy Bar, and they sell local dairy products as well as ice cream treats, coffee, donuts. So they're really popular um, just outside of the community. Like it's it's not really Elmer, but I mean, like we're, we kind of utilize all of this area <laughs> um, is we have, you know, a lot of natural parks that are really good for outdoor, outdoor activities like picnicking, canoeing hiking, fishing, camping. Um, we have an old Carolinian forest that is, uh, you know, historic and a, and a beautiful hiking path as well. Um, and for families, there's a really great adventure park, just again, ju like just outside of Elmer, like a stone throw is called Clovermead. And it is an old um, beekeeping farm that has since been like renovated to be a amusement park, like a, a, a adventure park, I would say. So that is really, really good for families um, and children. So that's a lot. So I'm looking forward. <laughs> I might have to spend like three or four days there because it seems like I'm going to have to pack in a lot. But you just mentioned something that I want to sort of ask sort of off the topic of tourism, but it's uh, something you just talked about a little bit. Elmer is well known for its tobacco industry back in the 2000s, early 19, late 1990s, early 2000s. And then the tobacco industry sort of shut down in, I believe, 2008, 2007? Yeah, area. around there. Has the town recovered from that closure? Because I know it was a big industry in your community. And then once it closed up, I think there was a bit of a shift economically, right? Yeah, so I would have to agree with you. And unfortunately, due to my age, I think <laughs> at that time, I wasn't really cognizant of what was going on. So I feel like my information might be limited. However, okay. no, we do have no, we do have um, industrial like big industrial, like even though that has shut down, like, for example, we have IGPC, which is an ethanol producing plant. So I think with when one door closed, another one opened and we have a shift of basically just industrial uh, services. So um I would say no. I would like I said, I, one door closed, another one opened, and yeah. that same that plant didn't stay vacant. Somebody took it over and repurposed it, and now it's called the Elgin Innovation Center, I believe, um, and it's been repurposed. So like instead of being one large factory for tobacco production, it's now individual businesses all in there, as well as this this local market. So it really was an advantageous utilization of that space, and very good for this town. Very good. Uh, getting back onto tourism. Thank you so much for answering that, by the way. Um, getting back onto tourism, I, I, I want to know, where do you go? Where's your decompression spot within the community? And yes, I'm going to ask you to basically pick Sophie's choice here. Pick your favorite child and tell me where in the community you like to go to decompress. But after a long day of council meetings, because I know those meetings can sometimes run 20 minutes, sometimes they can run eight hours, depending on what's in front of them. Where do you go in the community to just decompress, let it all go, and know that tomorrow morning you're going to have to get back up and do it all over again, potentially? I think that answer has a multitude, or that question has a multitude of answers. Um, I'm predominantly a homebody. So, I mean, if I if it was, especially during this weather, if I was to come home, um, you know, grab a glass of wine, sit down with my husband, watch a show, like that's, that's my happy place. Um, we also, you know, put a lot of work into our home and our backyard. So it's, it's really enjoyable to have like a fire outside and a glass of wine and just relax. So homebody essentially, but if the weather's, uh, positive, then I mean, there's, I would be probably hiking in the neighborhood trails, like the, uh, Carolinian forest of spring water, or I would be, if it was really sunny and warm, I would be down at Port Bruce on the beach, uh, relaxing. So I think those either being in nature or a homebody would be my, my answer for that. Thank you. So we started by talking about you on the show and we're ending by talking about the town. And I want to ask the million dollar question to end this episode. And I think every municipal co councillor politician knows how to answer it. I just like to get it on the record. 
What makes the town of Elmer such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think that's a very good question. And I've watched your show enough. So yes, I have heard the answers. And I think they're all fairly similar. Um, firstly, the community. Elmer has that great small town charm and a welcoming community. Um, proximity, you know, we have access to amenities right here in our community, like essential amenities, but we're a comfortable proximity to larger urban areas. You know, we're 20 minutes to Tilsonburg, 15 minutes to St. Thomas, 30 minutes to London, and it's a direct to the highway, right? So um, it's very reasonable for those who need to commute for work or other services. Um, we're blessed with a well-equipped emergency response force, uh, police and fire, which makes it a very safe place to raise a family. Um, and we're surrounded by beautiful, diverse landscapes. You know, we have the Lake Erie beachfront. We have the historic Carolinian forests. We have roaming agricultural land um, and other neighboring municipalities and communities that pride themselves on tourism and culture. So it's, I love just staying in this area. Like I, um, I feel the more and more, especially becoming a mother, like I don't gravitate to the city. I stay here. If I can get it here, I'm, I'm not leaving. <laughs> so um, I think, and that's how the majority of our citizens feel. Uh, we're, we're extremely blessed and uh, I'm, I'm honored to represent Elmer. Counselor, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this. It's always a pleasure to sit down with engaged, informative, and also passionate counselors like yourself who want the betterment for their community. And uh, I know change is often hard and getting people involved is even harder than change. But I feel like from the 45 minute conversation we've had so far, you are the person to do that. You are the person to bring change where change is needed. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for serving your community. I do not think municipal politicians hear that enough. You guys are the first line of uh, government and the most important line of government. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for appearing on the show. Thank you for having me. Like it's, this is, this was fun. I like this. It was really engaging. And I'm glad that there's people out there that are engaging with those smaller municipalities and not just focusing on the ones federal and provincial because like you were right like we, we're the ones you know we're the first line of defense that we're engaging with our residents so i think having that opportunity and that platform to highlight you know those those topics are is it's, it's amazing it's essential and you know thank you for doing this this is amazing and if, if our algorithms are anything to be believed, which I think they are, Ottawa seems to be listening to us. So uh, for those who are in Ottawa, get, out, get outside those large zones and actually go talk to these smaller communities because they are often the backbone of our society. Thanks so much, Counselor. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Now, if you have found this episode eye-opening, please hit that subscribe button. Stay in the loop with our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive Canadian municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth, and the maintenance of this top-notch show can't happen without you. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.